Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Corey Thornton. I am the Managing Editor for Market Intelligence at Open Minds. Today, as part of our weekly executive web forum series, Open Minds Vice President Richard Lewis will discuss the best practices for evaluating and improving your organization's service lines. Mr. Lewis has extensive experience as a behavioral health care administrator, business development, and uh, has experience in new service lines for behavioral health care organizations nationally. Before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping reminders. Your audio will be muted during today's briefing, but we also rely on your questions and comments via the question box on the right side of your screen. You can send in those questions throughout the briefing and Mr. Lewis will answer them. The slides and recording from today's briefing will also be available online tomorrow at the Open Minds website. And with that, let me introduce Richard Lewis. Thank you, Corey, and good morning, everybody. Um, we've got one hour to talk about uh, repurposing and developing new uh, revenue streams. I'm going to cram a lot of information uh, um, into this session and um, kind of skip through our, our, our presentation as quickly as I can. Want to make sure we have time for questions and answers. And as Corey mentioned, you'll have access to the recording if you want to review um, review today's session. Um, today we're we're talking about uh, repurposing um, your current capabilities or your current service lines um, within the context of uh, um, the, the the COVID pandemic in um, you know organizations across the country um, working on sustainability planning and recovery planning and uh, as a result of of that um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the value of repurposing service lines. Um, want to talk a bit about uh, revisiting your operational capabilities uh, as a foundation to building either new service lines or repurposing your service lines in um, today's um, uh, increased managed care and value-based reimbursement environment. Uh, portfolio analysis, really portfolio analysis, really talk a little bit about some of the tools that you can use. Um, uh, to assessing your your service lines and seeing um, you know who are the winners, who are the losers, which are the service lines that maybe we should be thinking about uh, divesting. Uh, a bit about service line assessment, and then lastly, I'd like to give a few case studies of of um, some organizations that repurpose service lines and used uh, some alternative payment approaches to to structure the the reimbursement, which is. Um, we're seeing a lot of these days. So exploring um, um, uh, exploring the repurposing of your current service lines um, really is an important part of uh, sustainability planning and recovery planning um, as part of you know this whole disrupted market uh, as a result of, of the pandemic. Um, looking at new strategies to address uh, new market demands. Uh, new ways of using technology um, and, and uh, changes in, the, in, in our competition are, are all part of what we're going to talk about today in, in, um, in repurposing um, service lines. So the, the pandemic has had a, a you know, very negative impact on, on specialty provider organizations in terms of our day-to-day -day business, um, social distancing and, and the other uh, you know, closure of non-essential businesses has really affected uh, uh, provider organizations' ability to um, uh, to keep a constant flow of, of referral sources, which has impacted um, uh, cash flow, which is resulting in reduced revenue, um, reduced capacity of services for many of our treatment sites as a result of, again, social distancing and those types of things, um, and a loss of key referral sources. So with these types of changes in the environment, um, taking a look at our, quickly taking a look at our service lines and our programs um, to see, you know, how, how can we maximize what we're currently doing um, is, is, is um, all part of our repurposing. Um, uh, some of the reasons that we want to think about repurposing existing service lines, I like to, I like to start with Number one, it's it's cheap and easy to repurpose a service line as opposed to um, you know developing a new service line from the ground up. Um, and today, in in uh, our our um, disrupted market environment, um, 
some of the reasons we want to look at are things like, you know, how do we use excess service capacity um, due to the decrease in referrals and limited access to on-site services. We may have uh, extra uh, licensed personnel or mental health professionals or, or health and human service professionals that you know can be part of these repurposing the staffing of repurposing these new these new programs uh, provide organization need for revenue diversification um, as a result of the pandemic uh, our, 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 uh, our public payers are experiencing uh, budget deficits um, our private payers such as uh, health plans and managed care organizations are changing some of the way some of the ways they're doing business like enhanced telehealth and virtual consultation, but also opening doors for new, uh, for new service lines. And um, these are things that we should take a look at. Um, repurposing is also one way to replenish, uh, to increase revenue uh, as a result of shrinking margins from the past five, six months. Uh, we want to take advantage of new market expansion opportunities due to emerging, uh, emerging markets and shifts with our competitors in terms of their capacity. Um, we want to expand, we want to be adding or expanding um, new treatment solutions for our payers as well as um, um, exploring uh, new population health management technologies and, and, and ways to use you know, virtual consultation to stay uh, competitive. So a couple, I wanted to talk just about a couple of uh, trends um here in 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 um in the marketplace that are really the results of the pandemic in um uh, emerging markets for services is a nice way to start our conversation about uh, new service line development or repurposing uh and i wanted to take a look at three areas where uh there's a lot of interest by payers um, and a lot of new opportunities emerging uh, for provider organizations to to consider um, telehealth and virtual consultation uh, services have surged uh, over the last five, six months because of the pandemic. Um, consumers are, are adopting uh, telehealth very well. Uh, most provider organizations have expanded uh, telehealth capacity to be able to meet the, the treatment needs of, uh, of their clients and the um, access needs for uh, payers and like health plans. Um, there, there is um, there is some belief that uh, consumer adoption and payer support will continue in some form beyond the crisis. Um, things that we're seeing right now with regard to telehealth and virtual consultation are, are health plans reporting uh, just a huge increase in utilization in telehealth, in telehealth contracting, and a lot of outreach of uh, of health plans reaching out to members of their uh, provider organizations in their provider networks to approach them about adapting or developing telehealth platforms, um, especially during this time of, of the pandemic. Um, we're seeing payers uh, um, being more flexible with reimbursement. Uh, Optima, as an example, started paying for inpatient, uh, intensive outpatient programming and partial hospitalization programs virtually uh, at the same rate as, as, uh, as in-person uh, visits would have been um, the nation's largest telehealth provider, Teladoc, for example, uh, um, plans to acquire a digital health company, Livongo, in an $18.5 billion deal. So we're seeing a lot of move in the market uh, in terms of uh, growing uh, companies and uh, mergers, acquisitions, those types of things. Um, Amwell and MD Live. Uh, two other uh, telehealth uh, platforms uh, are talking about uh, going public. So we're certainly seeing a lot of um, a lot of movement in the virtual world and the telehealth world um, as a result of, of uh, our current environment. Um, there is discussion that um, telehealth will likely stay around, um, especially if it can be linked to um, improved access to care, uh, improved no-show rates, um, incre increased consumer engagement, um, and better uh, follow-up care. Um, we the health plans will likely continue um, in that direction with with some sort of you know telehealth and you know in-person type services. So um, one big area for 
um, uh, service line development or repurposing is, is certainly the, um, the telehealth and virtual consultation area. Integrated and whole person care approaches is another, um, another area. I think that um, the COVID pandemic, uh, we've seen that, you know, those folks that are uh, diagnosed with COVID ending up in the hospital are folks that have coexisting or comorbid uh, chronic uh, medical conditions. Um, you know, half of Americans suffer from many of these conditions like diabetes and, and, and you know, heart conditions. We certainly know that um, a, a large percentage of, uh, of our consumer our consumers with serious mental illness have at least one and oftentimes more than one uh, um, chronic medical condition. So the whole idea of developing approaches that uh, are using integrated models of care and whole person care to uh, address the, the, the behavioral health, the physical health, the, all the different issues that, that uh, complex populations have um, is, is where um, is, is where payers are looking to towards now. Um, I made a note on the side that here in California, just earlier this year, um, the state released uh, funding uh, for the managed care plans to be able to work with provider organizations uh, that made eligibility uh, to, to start to develop some of the initial um, systems and platforms of integrated uh, integrated approaches in, in terms of um, assessment and and um, treatment programs and, and prevention and those types of things. So um, uh, something to watch as, as an area for um, new service line development. And probably one of the biggies is, is in-home treatment services. Um, the, the pandemic has certainly, because everyone has to stay home now, has really uh, put a huge focus on treatment modalities and approaches that can be done in home. Uh, here in California, um, as a way to uh, decompress skilled nursing facilities here during the crisis, um, the California has uh, launched um, the California Medicaid Long-Term Care at Home Initiative, which actually changes the Medi-Cal benefits here for long-term care and allows folks to stay in home um, and, and receive um, uh, many of the types of services that they would have, uh, that they would have received in long-term care setting um, at home. Um, is this is this an area for um, thinking about as far as new service line development, repurposing your current um, programs? Um, absolutely. In this model, there is funding for um, uh, mental health treatment for the mild to moderate level uh, of service for clients. And um, um, if you're a provider organization in California, and, and you may have uh, because of reduced capacity. Um, available licensed uh, mental health professionals, for example, um, this may be something that you want to look at as a new funding source and as a way to repurpose uh, folks and 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 and, and uh, move into this in-home treatment space um, as this develops here um, as a new revenue source here in California. But really, all three are areas I just wanted to open up with that things to be thinking about when we're repurposing uh, in your market. Um, these are the three big themes, if you will, nationally, um, and just things to kind of keep in the back of your head. Um, I want to start with operational capabilities, and as we're thinking about repurposing our, our, our programs and services, um, we want to start by revisiting our operational capabilities as, as it pertains to um, the systems that you need in place uh, to um, provide services in a, in a managed care environment and, and increasingly in a, um, a value-based reimbursement um, type market. Um, um, repurposing um, our, our programs and services um, needs to be able to meet uh, payer uh, demands and expectations for uh, treatment delivery uh, as well as outcomes. So um, being able to, 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 to have the, the systems in place that can help you do that are important. Uh, with more and more states moving into Medicaid managed care, more and more states moving into uh, you know, value-based or performance-based uh, reimbursement models uh, with providers, um, this has become increasingly important. 
And more and more specialty provider organizations are seeing uh, an increase in the revenue coming from um, these types of new models um, from both um, public payers as well as, as well as health plans. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of the operational capabilities that we want to be able to have really, again, as our foundation for, for building um, some of our some of these new service lines or, or repurposing, adapting new or, or existing service lines. And um, I want to focus on nine areas, and I'm not going to go through the details of each, but rather just give a brief, some examples of, of, of how these systems translate into uh, your interface uh, with the payer, your performance or engagement with clients to be able to achieve health plan or, or payer goals um, in, in the managed care market. And we'll talk about clinical operations. We'll talk about um, uh, you know, consumer-centric intake systems, the marketing and business development um, uh, um, aspects that you want to be able to build uh, referral volume and drive business, uh, making sure we have the billing and recycle management systems in place for uh, for high volume um, 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 treatment treatment programs, um, leadership and human services, you know, making sure organizations are 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 um, understand that our, our staff from actually really from our board to our C-suite level folks to our line staff understand uh, what managed care is, what what performance based uh, 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 reimbursement looks like, and and what is their role in that at the at the line level? Because it's really about what we produce on the line that gives us our outcomes um, in these in these arrangements. A little about metrics management, QA, and and, and uh, margin management. So clinical operations, uh, I, I think the biggest example, uh, and there's many, but the one that I wanted to focus on really has to do with. Uh, your organization's uh, uh, ability to provide good case management for um, continued stay reviews, and, and in this, and for this example, we use Health Plan with Health Plan Care Managers, um, uh, making sure that a, a a case manager at the provider services level has been retrained and reoriented to understanding the um, the uh, goals and expectations of the health plan as a payer and what the care managers are looking for in, in successful, effective, continued stay reviews, making sure that we're giving them the, the treatment information, um, uh, discharge planning info, um, placement information, whatever it is that they're looking for um, in, in our updates that's gonna get us additional days of, of care is, um, is one is, was really important. Um, Focusing on things like relapse prevention in our concurrent stay reviews uh, is really, really important. Health plans want to know, payers want to know that uh, we're planning ahead, especially for, for folks that may have um, high incidence of hospital readmission or, um, or treatment, pay, treatment or frequent tr treatment failures in the outpatient setting. Um, these are the, you know, those providers that are addressing these types of issues in the treatment setting and working with the, with the payers on solutions for ongoing treatment are, are, are the ones that um, health plans really value. Customer-centric intake and admissions, um, some examples of, of, of things that you're gonna wanna have in your, um, in your intake department. Um, our, 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 our intake and admissions department on process is critical when working with, uh, with uh, managed care or VBR payers or arrangements. Um, easy access to care for clients is very, very important, making sure we have 800 numbers and, and, and um, things on our website so that folks can make referrals easily is really important. Tracking the data with regard to number of referrals and, and, and clients coming into treatment is important. We wanna know, uh, and payers in many, in many cases are gonna wanna know what our no-show rates are, uh, what our conversion rate is, and the conversion rate is uh, the rate of client that goes from assess that goes from uh, initial assessment to to treatment, or from referral call to assessment. Those are numbers that are very important for us to know about, uh, for you to know about, um, to demonstrate um, uh, having a good, you know, front end accessible intake system uh, for uh, patient referrals. 
Business development is another um, uh, aspect or another um, part of our operational systems that we need to have in place, especially right now during the time of, of the pandemic, when the market is, is in chaos, when um, our, everybody's been disruptive in terms of services and service capacity and, and how we're delivering care. Um, having a, a, an account manager or, or someone in your marketing team that's looking at the market right now uh, for um, uh, any kind of changes, you know, um, um, payer uh, demand for, for new types of services or changes in your services is important. Um, someone who's be able to participate in strategic planning and, and positioning your, your, your organization for the short term, getting through the next six months as we're entering our, our recovery planning is important. Um, competitive analysis, again, what are our competitors doing in the market right now? Um, but these types of uh, positions are really critical um, right now, but uh, are also a big part of being able to, to, um, to work within a managed care environment or a value-based reimbursement arrangement, um, developing uh, formal pathways for referrals, uh, developing strategies to keep referral volume um, high, so our caseloads are high. Uh, um, what are some new uh, referral networks that we can develop right now to feed these types of programs? All, all come under the purview of your market and business development folks and are really, really important. Um, a couple items with regard to um, uh, revenue cycle management, and we'll talk to them and give a couple examples from uh, looking at admissions and billing and, 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 and those things. Um, having the systems in place and then making sure they're, they're, they're running properly right now uh, with regard to um, policies related to you know, client registration and demographics for um, eligibility verification. Um, having in place the systems to do insurance verification is important. Uh, getting the pre-authorizations for service, um, um, self-pay fee assessment and policy collection is, is critical. Uh, policies that are in place for uh, collecting co-pays and deductibles. Uh, increasingly with um, health plans going more and more to more high deductible um, uh, and more co-pay type scenarios for beneficiaries, um, a lot of your revenue is going to be coming from those co-payments and deductibles. And health plans I, I want to see you collecting those, uh, th those, um, uh, those co-pays and deductibles. So policy systems in place for that is is very important in this you know, working with 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 uh, managed care um, billing um, again systems in place to be able to do um, you know electronic billing uh, billing at least weekly is important QA uh, you know some type of quality insurance that's that's monitoring uh, your key performance you know your key performance of billing metrics to make sure that you're on 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 target with whatever, the, whatever those goals uh, need to be. Um, and then I put a list here of just some, some basic policy procedures. You probably have most of these, but if you don't um, make a note of some of these and, and make sure that these are things that you have in place, um, um, you know, the reporting is a key element of, of, of billing performance and, and tracking billing performance. So, um, um, having these things in place. And lastly, under, under uh, revenue cycle managers collections, and I, I touched on that a minute ago, but you want to be able to, to have systems in place to track your denials, um, uh, making sure that we're tracking clients that, that access service that weren't eligible or, or, um, you pro or services you provide that may not have been covered. And these are things that are going to be denied and, um, and certainly things that you want to know about and re revisiting with your program folks to make sure that we're we're kind of aligned with um, um, you know with in, in these areas and again there's a list of some basic policies there that we should be aware of um, uh, with regard to um, to collections leadership and human resources I, I think sometimes gets overlooked um, as an essential uh, part of our operational capabilities uh, to keep it so, so that an or provider organization is able to do be successful in um, 
uh, providing services under managed care or VBR contracts. Um, the idea of, of, um, of culture change and educating an organization really from the board uh, down to the C-suite, down to our managers and directors is, is really important. Um, that everybody at every level understands the expectations and the goals of, of, of managed care and what it is, of, uh, of uh, if you're involved in a uh, performance-based arrangement uh, under VBR, you know, uh, everybody needs to be on board with what that looks like, what the goals are, what they need to understand their role is as part of uh, contributing to uh, achieving those uh, those goals for for good financial performance. So um, the the whole um, uh, human services part of of this is important. Um, we're seeing more and more uh, organizations that are involved in performance based uh, models of care, um, making sure that even compensation packages are linked to performance, all the way down to to line supervisors in some cases. So some things to think about if we want to, uh, for, um, for success in this environment. You know, I didn't put much about information technology systems because we could probably do a three hour presentation just on EHR, uh, but only to say that uh, wanting to make sure that uh, uh, your EHR is strong, um, that it has the, the, the right types of software for operability and interface repairs and billing and and and, and tied to our, our our tracking outcomes. I mean, all, all of these things need to be built into our, our EHRs and um, the, the analytics and, and the reporting is critical um, in managed care contracting and especially in, in value-based reimbursement approaches. So um, revisiting that to make sure we've got a robust system in place is very important. Metrics management, uh, again, these are all foundational pieces of your organization that you want in place or, or, or are developing or, or in the process of updating um, so we can move into more managed care and uh, uh, performance-based um, um, uh, approaches. Uh, metric management is, is, is critical. Um, uh, having strategic key performance indicators that track your organization's performance is important. Um, you have a you know a director or somebody who's in charge of of your um, uh, metrics management and your analysis and reporting, um, being able to document the clinical impact of your services, you know, generating the reporting and uh, to demonstrate good clinical outcomes, good service delivery outcomes, uh, good population health management, case management outcomes. Um, um, good discharge, linkage to community outcomes. I mean, all of these are things that are are built into what um, uh, our performance-based uh, uh, contracts are, are looking at. And and don't forget to include um, the outcomes and related measures that your your health plans are using. So we want to know what's important to them. And usually we're talking about HEDIS measures, um, stars. Uh, measures if we're talking about uh, Medicare populations. Uh, next is quality management and QA and um, just a few examples here, you know, in, in terms of having a QA management uh, program, uh, we want to make sure that our, our, our MCO quality expectations, as I mentioned a minute ago, are incorporated and being tracked and monitored in, in your um, quality assurance programming. Um, I mentioned a minute ago, HEDIS um, is, is, is probably the, the, the main measures that most payers are looking at right now um, in the area of, of reducing hospital readmission and, and reducing emergency department visits. The things that are high spend for payers are the things that uh, are, are being focused on right now. Um, and of course, that as part of your quality management program, that you're maintaining records with regard to appeals, um, and that you're able to make the corrections needed um, uh, and, and, and modify your service delivery uh, to reduce things like denials and, and, um, and those types of things is, is very important. Margin, man, margin management, I, think, I mean, I think it kind of speaks to yourself. I mean, um, uh, knowing the unit cost for each of your programs and services is very important in uh, managed care um, uh, arrangements um, using um, 
um, uh, cost and target market margin reporting um, that, that's shared with your program staff. Again, uh, it's, you know, it's our, our program folks in addition to our, our um, financial folks and our admin folks working together as a team to achieve the, the, the treatment goals, the outcomes goals that our payers are expecting. And again, when I talk about payers, in, in, in today's environment, we're talking about both, you know, public payers, state Medicaid, as well as uh, private payers like health plans and managed care organizations. Um, and um, um, uh, managers are training to give uh, necessary skills to both manage costs and ensure quality. And we touched about we touched on that. So let's talk about as I'm watching our time. Um, a little bit, uh, so well, well, let me say this, um, our operational capabilities, again, are, are, are the foundation, the bedrock from where we start in, in, um, in making sure we have robust systems in place uh, so that we can um, manage our new service lines and develop uh, new programs and services off of these, off of these systems, which pretty much are, are now required by, by, by all payers, both public and private. Um, second to that is understanding what we do well. And, um, you know, right now, um, that's probably um, even more important uh, because of the business challenges that we've had over the past five or six months because of the pandemic um, with the, um, you know, reduced referral sources, reduced cash flow, reduced margins, and all the, the things that, that have impacted us and making, um, making things pretty difficult for uh, being successful at the moment. So during a crisis like this, um, what are the questions we should be asking ourselves? Um, if the changing environment, and you know, I can't see, I can't see that question here. Let me, let me look at something here really quick. Um, in the current in the current changing web, so here's the question we should be asking ourselves in the current changing environment what service lines have a positive margin or or at least break even for us uh, what service lines have a negative margin and um, will draw down on available cash um, what service lines are critical to success after the crisis and may need stabilization and investment uh, as part of our uh, our our, um, our post covid recovery and when you put these things, if you when you put these service lines together and look at them in the entirety of your organizational financial performance, if no changes are made, does the organization have enough cash to make it through the crisis period? Um, and that's really what 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 the focus is right now for most organizations in terms of uh, sustainability planning and uh, um, keeping services and operations going in the in with the market changes and, and the challenges that we're facing in uh, uh, because of the pandemic. Um, I thought I would share uh, as part of um, understanding what you do well and, and really taking a look at, at your current programs and services um, at, at, at some portfolio analysis mapping. And I wanted to briefly just touch base on some of the tools that we use here at Open Minds when we're working with clients to help um, clients assess and take a real, a deep dive, if you will, into, um, um, you know, into their current service lines and, 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 and um, when thinking about um, um, repurposing. Um, this really is, is, a, is, is something that um, we probably should be doing on an annual basis as part of our strategic planning process. And that is every year taking a look at how did we perform last year, which, which of our programs uh, were profitable, which of our programs broke even, which programs maybe didn't do so well. And maybe those are the more, uh, programs that we, we focus on for repurposing and, and you know, redistributing resources. So we'll talk a bit, uh, let's look at, I'm just gonna go over real quickly, these four tools, um, market growth versus uh, market share um, um, uh, matrix uh, uh, um, analysis, um, we'll look at competitive position versus in industry attractiveness. We're going to look at a tool that uh, looks at market risk versus uh, market reward. And then uh, the last one is mission versus profitability. Um, 
really a tool mainly used by um, mainly used by nonprofit providers. So market growth versus market share. In um, this is a tool used to, to plot your organization service lines by market growth. Um, it, it 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 has four uh, different uh, quadrants, if you will. And, and I like the names here: stars, cash cows, question marks, and dogs. You know, stars are your service lines that um, have, high, have high market share and, and high growth. Um, these are usually your, your your programs and services that are are doing well. Um, and and are, are are strongly positioned in the market. Um, this tool will break out uh, what, what we call cash cows, which are the service lines that have high relative market share in low uh, in low growth markets. Um, these are likely some of your core service lines that have been around for a long time. Uh, question marks are service lines where the market growth rate is high, yet your organization has a low market share. Um, and will require you know some some investment in in improving these. Um, these are the new service lines and development that could move to stars category uh, with with a little investment and a little retooling. And dogs are are the service lines where your organization has low market share um, that have low market growth. And these are usually the, the these are usually the service lines that you're you want to think about um, cutting loose and, and divesting. So the market growth versus market share matrix is one tool. And again, these are just a real, uh, just bullet point aspects of what, what this looks like. But this is a, a valuable tool for, um, for taking a look at, um, as, as part of portfolio analysis and looking at your, at your programs and services. Um, the competitive position versus industry attractiveness uh, tool um, has two dimensions. Um, that look at the attractiveness of your service line and your organization's competitive positioning. Uh, so these are really good to, to, to look at. Um, um, takes a look at uh, your, your, the size of your, of your program and footprint, market positioning, um, strengths and weaknesses uh, from a, from a uh, competitive perspective. And then industry attractiveness in terms of, of, um, of uh, um, an, an assessment of of the field of venture uh, under consideration in terms of total spending, pricing, competitive structure, profitability, um, social issues, and those types of things. So this tool really is um, uh, um, uh, is one of the three broad strategic mandates for each of your organization service lines, and and really will help you look at um, you know the investment and in capital capital that will be needed. Uh, to improve your market position, um, uh, hold uh, you know, improving cash balancing generation, select for cash use, and and then making decisions on which service lines that we should be divesting because of of poor performance and drawdown on on organizational resources. Uh, market matrix versus market reward, um, uh, market risk versus market reward. Um, this one really takes a look at uh, at four areas uh, in terms of our service lines, um, uh, service line success, and I, I like this one and probably use this one the most. Um, this has uh, our, our assessment broken out into four categories: pearls, oysters, bread and butter, and white elephants. Um, your pearls are the service lines that are in development that have a high likelihood of success and are expected to yield high rewards. Um, our oysters are the speculative service lines that you believe will result in high payoff, but have low likelihood of success. Um, uh, other services may fall under the category of, of bread and butter. Usually, those are the services that result uh, that are the results of enhancements or modifications to current service lines. Uh, they tend to be easy to develop and have a high likelihood of success and low rewards. Um, um, these tend to be um, um, here, here there, the key here is to make certain that organization does not have too many of the bread and butter projects because they draw resources from uh, pearls and oysters. And lastly is our white elephants are the low success, low reward uh, projects. Uh, most organizations have a few of these that they find hard to eliminate. Uh, I think uh, right now, especially during, um, 
during these challenging times, um, reallocating, you know, looking at these kind of programs to reallocate resources into repurposing and new service line development for uh, the new opportunities in the market is 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 a good place to draw uh, is a good place to draw resources from to to do that. Mission and profitability. Um, this tool is used mostly by nonprofit organizations, uh, both behavioral health and social service um, agencies. And the, the tool displays organizations, uh, your service lines based on the ability to cover costs or profitability and the compatibility with your mission. Um, you know, these are, are, are two of the areas that um, you, this program, will, this is, uh, matrix will, will lay out for you um, um, again, we, the, the whole goal here is uh, in this model is to identify areas where we can improve financial performance um, um, and, and, and improve cost effectiveness in our service lines, in our, in our um, nonprofit uh, uh, um, organizations um, and how to, uh, and funding the service line deficit with donations or profits from other service lines reducing the scope of size of the service line are all ways to, um, to do that. And the last one is the low mission compatibility, low profit, uh, which is the product lines that lose money. Again, those would be our white elephants, if you will, from our previous, uh, our previous tool. Uh, but another, one other tool to look at for um, um, taking a look at, uh, at our services and, and, and trying to come up with um, ways to address um, new service line development or, or repurposing. So we'll talk a little bit, we've talked a little bit about um, some of the big areas uh, where we're seeing growth, telehealth, um, whole person care models, integrated care models, um, um, and in-home services. We've talked about the uh, um, the operational systems that you really want to have in place to be able to build off and create uh, new service lines that are addressing new needs, new opportunities in the market, or, re or, or, um, or repurposing. Um, we went over a couple of tools very briefly that, um, that you can use to do uh, portfolio analysis and trying to identify those programs that are doing well, those programs that aren't doing so well. Um, and so now I want to talk a little bit about, about uh, service line, about doing um, service line assessments. And um, uh, the best way and the best approach uh, to, to look at repurposing and, and, and service line uh, development is really to do a, a feasibility study or feasibility analysis. And um, um, a feasibility study will help you answer um, a lot of questions that you'll be that you'll have but you know things like is this the right service line for the current market uh, will repurposing this service line provide a sustainable and reasonable turn a re reasonable return on investment um, a feasibility study will really focus you in on looking at at um, the real details of, of what a new program description or service line description uh, developing a service line description um, it, it'll it'll uh, force you to take a look at your competition in the market um, and you'll do a little bit of financial analysis so that we are able to make some preliminary decision about whether we move forward with a new with with a repurposed program or or maybe we decide not to so you know the first uh, first piece of um, well, feasibility analysis is is really um, analyzing the market and your competition. Um, and right now, uh, in during this during during the pandemic, uh, with with your market likely being um, in flux and changing rapidly, um, this is something that you want to be doing right now anyway. So um, taking a look at um, new opportunities for uh, for for revenue. Uh, for referral sources, for new program, uh, for developing new programs are all the things you want to be looking at. What are the threats out there? Um, they may be they may be fiscal as as funding is uh, uh, reimbursement may not be as available in some of your public contracts, for example. Um, they may be threats from competition. 
So we want to look at four areas um, as part of this analysis. And I'm just giving just a couple of examples uh, for, for this piece of your feasibility study. And, and, um, and that is, um, um, you know, who are our customers? Um, um, you know, what are the populations uh, that need to be served? Um, um, picking the right target population. If you're going to be repurposing the program is critical. We want to make sure that the need is there in, in the market. Um, customers isn't, is not, doesn't refer only to uh, consumers, but customers could also be um, your, your payers and, 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 and your, your major referral sources as well. Um, we want to look at our payers and we want to do, um, see what their needs are in this market. We know the payers, as we talked about earlier, are increasingly, or at least now, interested in more telehealth uh, as a way to get services uh, to their members and keep access available for members for, for services. Um, uh, we want to know what the current reimbursement is for services um, by talking to health plans, by talking to our, 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 public, um, uh, our public payers. Um, our, our, in some cases, rates may be going up. In some cases, rates may be going down, but we want to know for, for which uh, uh, for which services are are um, are, are these rates? Uh, what are the rates for these services? Are there any potential partnership opportunities that offer geographic advantage or, or, or expansion? Um, this one, I think, in the past has been something that uh, provider organizations have really really left to, to 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 the end. It's probably the last thing to look at, but right now it's probably moved up to probably the top three. Um, in, a, in a market where um, service capacity has been shifting so much uh, with a closure of programs, with a reduced capacity, um, with, the, with the focus on, on uh, whole person care models, um, being able to align yourself as a uh, behavioral health, as a mental health provider in your market with a uh, substance abuse disorder uh, treatment program, or a primary care provider. Um, these are certainly ways to expand your footprint it's and position yourself for, um, for new opportunities with the payers. And, it, and it's a great way to um, um, expand your referral volume and improve uh, your clinical outcomes for, for your clients. As part of our analysis of the market and competition, uh, we wanna know um, where our referrals are gonna be coming from. Um, we don't want to build a program or, or um, um, repurpose a program that um, the real they're just the referrals just aren't out there, or maybe because of the pandemic, um, there are just too many barriers for getting referrals to your program because of of, of, of social distancing and, and 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 lack of ability for for one to one um, engagement with clients and those types of things um, are, are really important. And, and we mentioned before competition. Who are your competitors? What's going on with your competitors? Who's closing? Who's expanding? Who's, who's merging or creating strategic alliances in your market? All of these are things that you're going to want to look at um, as part of your uh, planning and, 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 and preparation for looking at, you know, uh, developing your new service line um, or repurposing an existing one. So, Redefining, uh, re redefining your service line is, um, is very important, especially when we're looking at um, uh, well, whether we're doing a, a new service line or you're repurposing a service line. Um, redefining it um, from an operational standpoint in terms of um, developing a detailed description operationally of the program um, is, is important. Um, using the findings from our market analysis we just talked about uh, with regard to what the payers are looking for, what are the target treatment populations, um, um, how are, who, where are the referrals going to come from, how are we going to generate those referrals, um, who will be our target um, referral sources are, are things that we want to start talking about in, in our operational description. Um, we want to address pricing. Um, and come up with some kind of a preliminary payment structure for the new service line so that we're 
we're starting to look at um, what are the resources that we're gonna, are gonna be needed and um, 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 you know, how do we price this so that we're, we're in line with what payers are willing to, to pay or may be interested in paying. And lastly, identifying the marketing resources needed to launch and grow a new service line. Um, again, this goes back to our, our discussion about marketing, business development, um, having a plan in place before you launch a repurposed service line is critical in making sure we know where referral sources are come from, how we're going to generate those referrals, the referral sources, what we anticipate volume to be so that we can um, be at census levels that are going to be viable and that work for us are, are, are part of our operational description. Um, a financial analysis is, is, is certainly critical and again, um, at this stage of the game, in this phase of a feasibility uh, analysis, these are, are, are fairly uh, preliminary um, deep dives into the things that we're talking about. Um, um, the, the financial analysis, as you can imagine, is, is, cri is critical in, um, in this process, um, being able to um, um, be able to look at um, the basic organizational structure structure of your new program um, from a financial perspective in terms of staffing and and and, and what the cost is going to be to to operate this this new service line will be part of your your analysis um, establishing a tentative pricing range based on your positioning and competitive landscape um, including a, a break-even analysis for your proposed service line um, is, is important. And all of these things put together will help us to make that final decision to make the next step. Um, you know, should we move forward with repurposing this program or does this, you know, there are just too many holes in our plan here that this just doesn't make sense. Uh, if the decision to move forward is a yes, it's a go, um, then moving on to your next steps, which are much more detailed um, program service line design uh, and development uh, would be the next phase. And then um, putting together a very detailed um, um, uh, program launch uh, plan um, that includes timelines and, and resources and, and all those things is, is important. So lastly, um, I wanted to do a couple of case studies in um, looking at uh, some provider scenarios where um, they repurposed, where they repurposed service lines, but also included alternative uh, payment approaches. Because I think what you'll find right now is your um, marketing or pitching a, a new service line or a, a repurposed you know, program is that um, some aspect of of, of uh, value-based reimbursement or, or a performance-based uh, component is likely going to be included. And actually, you, you, you want that to be included um, as, as you're moving forward. So I'll talk, I'll talk first um, um, in the last 10, 15 minutes that we have about these, um, about these programs. And um, the first case study is a uh, community-based mental health provider that uh, repurposed their, their case management, uh, field-based case management capability uh, to address um, the needs of a payer, in this case, uh, Kaiser Permanente. And their, their problem at Kaiser was a, um, um, was um, their, their serious mentally ill uh, clients having high inpatient psychiatric hospital uh, readmissions and and low uh, um, and, and and high no-show rates to outpatient treatment services, um, which which resulted in low HEDIS scores for the payer for for Kaiser in this case. Um, the results of the of the of, of repurposing is here um, in a one-year pilot with with Kaiser repurposing case management that was originally dedicated to um, county contract type services like full service partnerships in it and ACT programs um, were able to reduce uh, hospital readmission with the target population uh, by 69%. Um, they improved um, linkage to uh, treatment post-hospital discharge 
um, the goal was seven to 10 days. And I think in this, in this uh, example, they were able to get clients uh, seen by a psychiatrist, a therapist, or a primary care doc within three to seven days of discharge. Um, so for the health plan, um, aside from the, the improved clinical outcomes, the reduction in the cost for, um, uh, for um, uh, hospital readmissions and ED visits, um, they benefited from improved HEDA scores for a health plan that's critical. And in this case, they improved, this, this program was able to improve Kaiser's, um, uh, the, HEDIS, the HEDIS scores for reduced hospital admissions, ED visits, and for improved um, linkage post-hospital discharge to licensed folks. The, the, the interesting thing about this program is that it was completely done on a um, uh, case rate model. This was uh, not fee-for-service, your traditional fee-for-service model and uh, we're able to do a per member per month arrangement, um, a, a higher rate for the initial couple of months while a client may be in this program due to high uh, acuity, and then a lower rate as clients stabilized um, in, in this model. So a good example of, again, repurposing in this case, um, case field-based case management capability to uh, meet the need of a pair and, and, and repurpose a service line that resulted in a, a new revenue source. Our second case study is a children's services provider and, and somewhat similar to the last one in that um, this children's service provider uh, um, was able to, again, in this case, repurpose um, field-based wraparound services that they been, were providing um, actually here in Los Angeles County um, to be able to um, participate in the new Blue Promise Medi-Cal Health Homes program um, that, that was launched here, I think it was last year, um, um, for uh, Medi-Cal beneficiaries and repurposed, you know, as, 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 as uh, their field-based care management folks or experts and working with complex um, uh, clients and families, um, they were able to, to meet the case management uh, needs uh, for Blue Promise um, in providing the care coordination for uh, health plan members, both on the physical health side as well as on the behavioral health side, working with the, with the health home. And um, again, uh, using an alternative based, an alternative payment model, um, this was a three tiered compensation structure where um, the provider was reimbursed um, a one-time payment for the initial member engagement um, uh, per member per month for providing the case management services, and then a, a quarterly performance-based payment, uh, again, per member per month, if they were able to meet certain goals for, um, for the plan. And, and lastly, um, is a case study for uh, a residential treatment provider that uh, was able to repurpose, um, if you will, repackage um, residential treatment, traditional re residential treatment services and outpatient uh, clinic-based services to um, provide uh, um, an alternative to uh, psychiatric hospitalization for health plans that had, uh, that had youth with um, high uh, hospital readmission rates and uh, a lot of uh, uh, frequent treatment failure in the outpatient setting. And this program, similar to the Kaiser model, uh, was able to address some of the HEDA scores, uh, issues that the pair was having with this population. Um, it resulted in, um, in uh, really good outcomes for uh, stabilization, community reentry, and long-term success in, in outpatient treatment. The model, uh, this was kind of a hybrid um, fee-for-service uh, reimbursement for the residential component, but a tiered uh, case rate approach for the outpatient treatment so that case management could be included, which is critical in, in keeping, um, you know, high-risk populations, complex folks um, stable in the community. And, um, and their goal was to uh, develop a, a new revenue stream uh, for coming from, from health plans. So with that, I'm, I'm trying to time this just right. I don't know we have, uh, where we're at, Corey, with, with our time and, and questions, but we're at that stage uh, of our presentation. We're, we're open to questions. All right, thanks, Richard. I do have a couple questions here. 
Uh, let's see, uh, the first one from John. If we're going to look at the trends that you presented earlier in the session, telehealth in home or integrated care, how fast is fast enough or too fast when developing a new service line? Um, well, I mean, uh, um, I think the answer is um, the, the quicker, the better right now. I mean, depending on your situation in the market that you're in, but um, it really, I mean, it really has to do with how quickly you can pivot and, and, and move into a new, uh, into one of those new market spaces we just talked about. Um, um, a lot of the, um, um, the timeline here for repurposing your service line will, will definitely uh, rely on, um, on um, your payers and, and, and the contracts that you're able to, to either, um, um, the, the new contracts you're able to develop or, the, or, or being able to renegotiate contracts for these new services and rates. And then lastly is, is um, how quickly can we drive referrals to this new process? So, um, you know, how fast is it fast enough? I think uh, for an organization that's looking for a new revenue opportunity, you know, places to uh, new revenue streams, ways to increase revenue um, and, and, and um, um, use, you know, unused capacity, I think the quicker the better. Thanks, Richard. And uh, one more question to get us going for today from Emily. What if the thing we are great at isn't financially great? What if it's mission critical and not so easily phased out? Well, that's one that that's actually a question that 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 comes up quite frequently uh, when working with provider organizations. And um, again, it gets back to the a lot of times, especially in our in our for, with our nonprofit provider organizations um, that that face this kind of an issue. Um, um, you know, if it's not financially viable, I think right now um, when things are so tight in terms of budgets and reimbursement and, and, and all the things that are COVID related, um, I think we need to take a real serious look at those programs and, and re reallocating those resources possibly to strengthening more, uh, uh, more successful service lines or, or repurposing uh, an existing service line. Um, the, the mission critical, um, I understand that, um, but I think the, the mission uh, that's most critical right now for provider organizations is staying viable and, and staying open, operating, and, and continuing to, um, you know, to do well in their market. Okay, Richard, I want to thank you, and I want to thank everybody else for joining us today. And I want to remind everyone that the slides and recording for this will be available on the Open Minds website tomorrow, and that we will be back next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern for the web forum, Process Engineering, How to Streamline Your Operations While Maintain Maintaining a great consumer experience. And with that, thank you again, Richard, and see you all next week. Bye-bye.